Joining me now is Congressman Jamie Raskin. He was the lead impeachment manager for Donald Trump's second impeachment trial and also served on the House Select Committee investigating January 6th. Thank you so much for joining me here this morning. You spent much of the last, more than a year, I should say, trying to build a case against Trump for his role in the insurrection. You and your colleagues studied Trump closely. You spoke to people who knew him and worked with him. Our democracy barely survived the first Trump term. Can our institutions withstand another one? Thank you for having me, Jen. Um, well, we survived because of the strength and resiliency of the Capitol officers and the political leaders who insisted that we go back in and count the Electoral College votes. And then um, everybody, all Americans across the political system, Republicans and Democrats, who rejected Trump's attempts to uh, impose a coup uh, in the 2020 election, like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, who said, no, he was not just going to go ahead and find thousands of votes that didn't exist for Trump. So there were a lot of people who stood up. Uh, the problem now is that Trump has purged a lot of the Raffensperger type officials from uh, the voting process. He's consolidated his hold over the Republican Party, and he's now embraced an explicitly authoritarian program. You know, when he ran back in 2016 and had never served in office before, a lot of people were saying, hey, this is a guy who's spoken about supporting national health care. This is a guy who is for uh, LGBTQ rights. We don't know what to expect. Well, we know exactly what uh, he has in mind for us this time, because it is an explicitly authoritarian program he's advancing for the country. He's bragging about essentially having packed and stacked the Supreme Court with these right-wing justices who have extinguished Roe versus Wade and are now uh, on a full-blown campaign to strip women of reproductive freedom in the country. He's talking about getting rid of civil servants in the Department of Justice and the FBI, replacing them with his partisan hacks, and then taking over Democrats cities and imposing his own law enforcement agenda. And we know what kind of corruption and anti-democratic moves he's capable of. So, you know, we are in the fight of our lives again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And so um, everybody in America who wants to stand up for constitutional democracy and freedom must recognize this as a moment of maximum emergency. Now, the good news, Jen, is the vast majority of Americans reject what Donald Trump and the Republican Party is now selling. The problem is that they have every anti-democratic trick in the book, beginning with the gerrymandering of congressional districts, the hijacking of the Supreme Court by preventing people like um, the current attorney general from even getting a hearing when he was nominated, when Merrick Garland was the chief of the D.C. Circuit. We see it in the suppression of voting rights, the manipulation of the Electoral College, and so on. So we have all of the anti-democratic institutions and practices that the Republican Party has mastered against the vast majority will. And the gun safety issue is a great case and study of this, because more than 90 percent of the people support a universal background check before violent criminals can get guns, and yet we're completely stymied by the GOP and the NRA's stranglehold over the political process. And that's the struggle that we're in today. Four members of the Proud Boys were con just convicted of seditious conspiracy this week. And in their defense, they all pointed the finger at the former president. Is it conceivable that special counsel Jack Smith could be considering seditious conspiracy charges against Trump? Absolutely. I mean, that's not a defense. I mean, if you're accused of conspiracy to overthrow the government or put down the government of the United States, which is what seditious conspiracy means, it's not a defense to say somebody else told me to do it or somebody else was involved in the conspiracy. Trump could very much have been part of the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers conspiracy, or he might have been involved in an overlapping concentric sing, uh, ring uh, conspiracy with those conspiracies. So so we don't have a system of justice, I hope, as I said at the January 6 hearings, where the foot soldiers and the ringleaders down below go to jail and the ringleaders above get a free pass and get to continue their insurrectionist assault on democratic institutions. So um, 
you know, we've seen a lot of justice take place here. The Department of Justice has been doing an excellent job. More than a thousand arrests, hundreds of convictions have taken place. More than a dozen people have been convicted of seditious conspiracy, completely refuting those who said, well, how could this be an insurrection if nobody was trying to overthrow the government? Well, now they have their answer. More than a dozen people have been convicted of that. And Donald Trump, of course, was impeached by a 232-vote margin in the House for inciting insurrection against the union, and 57 of 100 senators agreed that he had uh, incited an insurrection against the union. We didn't reach the magic two-thirds number to convict the president, and yet we have robust concurrent majorities of both houses of Congress declaring that that's precisely what he did as a matter of constitutional fact. There's a, also a big debt ceiling fight going on here, Congressman. We're dangerously close to a default. President Biden is meeting this week with Kevin McCarthy. But it doesn't seem like Republicans are budging. There's some debate, as you know, about whether or not the president could invoke the 14th Amendment to raise the debt ceiling on its own. As a constitutional lawyer, do you think he has that authority? And is it something you think he should do? Um, I think he has that authority under these circumstances, absolutely, because uh, the Congress has put him in a constitutionally untenable position. Um, Section 4 of the 14th Amendment says that the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. So if Congress votes to spend all of this money, and it's only Congress that can do it, and appropriates um, all of this money, and yet does not allow the debt limit to go up, at that point, the president is looking at either um, not abiding by the spending bills that Congress has passed and not meeting the rightful demands of Social Security recipients and bondholders and people who are owed money by the United States, or um, he's looking at not abiding by the debt limit. So he's not going to be ab he's not going to be able to respect one set of laws or the other. But in one case, if he decides to default for the country, he's also violating the Constitution, because the 14th Amendment says you can't do that. The, uh, the validity of the public debt cannot be questioned. This has never happened before. So Professor Tribe has an excellent piece in The New York Times today um, invoking the correct historical analogy, which is Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War saying uh, he is going to have to disregard momentarily habeas corpus because he's not going to let every other law in the union go unrecognized just so one law can be observed. Congressman Jamie Raskin, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I learned so much. Thank you. And congratulations on kicking cancer's butt as well. We're so happy about that news, too.